Well, brethren, let's turn back to First John in our Bibles, First John and chapter 1. <clears throat> I will commence reading from the first verse, and we'll make our way to verse 6, as we will be dealing in this second session on uh, the hypocrite's misguided claim to communion with God, the hypocrite's misguided claim to communion with God. Verse 1, 1 John chapter 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest, and we have seen it, and testify to it, and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. Indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him, while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. We'll end our reading there. Well, the theme of the conference is uh, communion with God, and it's one of those topics that no doubt speaks to us about the privilege that we have as God's people. What we have entered into by way of experience. Uh, the Apostle Paul writing to uh, the Romans at the beginning of chapter 5 says that since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And he speaks about us, therefore, entering into this grace, he says, in which we now stand. So it's something of the details, the menu that makes up standing in that state of grace that really we are busy considering using different subjects and topics and texts. Well, in First John and uh, chapter 1, we initially yesterday began uh, by noticing the one with whom we have this privileged fellowship or communion. And we saw in this case the person being uh, the Lord Jesus Christ uh, as, as the one that is obviously representing the, the Godhead. We also went on to see something of what that meant for the apostles. And they were speaking in terms of hearing him, seeing him, touching him, and so forth. But we argued that that was not simply referring to the outward activity because so many individuals who did that still ended up in hell. Rather, it was the fact that there was a work of the Holy Spirit that made these outward activities spiritually significant. And it was the work of regeneration, the work of bringing us into union with the, the Son, and it was that act of union that finally therefore gave birth to the life of God flowing through us and therefore making us one with him in every sense. And then finally, we reckoned with the fact that this doesn't just bring us into communion with God, it is also the horizontal fruit of it. And it is 
as we are therefore united to Christ and you are united to Christ and they are united to Christ, we find that we are together having communion with one another. A lot of that I hope to deal with again tomorrow as we will now go on to deal especially with something of that rich feast that is ours in this same communion that we have with the living God. But before we come to that rich feast, there is what we are dealing with today, and that is the hypocrite's false or misguided claim. John is the one who brings this about in verse 5 and verse 6. And basically, it is the beginning of a number of if closes he and they are all built on one reality and it is this god is light so we're beginning with god and knowing who he is we then have these inevitable implications one after the other so in verse 6 we have the one we'll be dealing with because god is light if we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie. In verse 7 is yet another. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, you will have all these implications. Again, verse 8. If we say we have no sin, again, because of who he is, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And on and on and on the apostle goes. Now this is normal to life and living. God has given us a mind that is able to add one and one and get two. He's the one who has made us reasonable creatures. And so if I was to say to you that A is equal to B and B is equal to C, you will all conclude that A must be equal to C. It's the way God has made us. We are rational creatures. And that's really what John is capitalizing on as he now deals with verse 5 and verse 6. He's basically saying the whole of life begins with God. It begins with who God is, or to put it another way, what kind of God there is. And then from there, we can start making serious deductions. If we miss out on that point, everywhere else we are going, we are going wrong. We must begin with the creator of the entire universe the governor of the whole of history. What kind of God is he? The ultimate judge of the living and the dead. What kind of being is he? And then ask ourselves the question, how am I relating to such a God? Well, that's the lengthy introduction. Let's see how John opens this topic up. First of all, he says in verse 5, this is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Immediately, the Apostle John lets us know something that is all important about the Christian faith equally important about the ministry that we are involved in as preachers. And it is this, that it has a givenness to it. That all we are are individuals who receive a message and pass it on as it is. We are not expected to be individuals who are coming up with our own servings 
and consequently keeping people happy and coming to us, as John himself puts it here, there is a message that they had heard, and it was that message that they had faithfully proclaimed to their hearers. And brethren, that's our job. Thankfully, we have this book. It's all there. Our job is to simply ensure that we are expounding this book. It's Steve Lawson who says that there are only two preachers on the planet. Those who are expounding God's word and those who ought to resign. <laughs> Just those two. And I think the point is well taken because there ought to only be one kind of preacher. Those that are taking the message, the historic message that has been explained in the scriptures and passing it on, full stop. Any others ought not to be there. Well, John, having said that, quickly goes into the nature of the God who is expounded in the scriptures. And he says there that God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. And really, the point that he's first of all making is the fact that he is absolute light. He is light not mingled with any amount of darkness. It's a light that obviously we ourselves cannot really speak about because whatever light we have seen is one that has some level of shadow in it. But at the same time, we must be clear that John is the usual John using all kinds of imagery in order to enable us to use all our senses in order to get in three-dimensional view that which he is actually teaching us. So when he speaks about God being light with no measure of darkness at all, what does he have in mind? I want to suggest three aspects, and I will take you very quickly to Ephesians to prove that. One is that he is speaking about God being goodness itself. Goodness. God is good. You remember the words of Jesus when he said, there is none that is good but God. And the second is in terms of righteousness, moral purity, ethical uprightness. That's the second aspect that comes out of this phrase, being the light. And again, we were hearing earlier concerning the contrasts that are there in the Bible. And one of them is always light and darkness, light and darkness and Often, when that is put together in contrast, darkness has to do with wickedness and evil and sin. And then thirdly, it is the aspect of truth. The aspect of truth. Again, we can't miss that because of the fact that uh, um, often when you are in a dark room, anybody can deceive you. But the moment the lights are turned on, well, hardly anyone can deceive because you are seeing what is present in that room. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 9. I'll begin reading from verse, um, verse 8, just for the sake of context. Ephesians 5 and verse 8. Paul says there, writing to the Ephesians, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. 
walk as children of light. And then he opens it up and says, for the fruit, the outcome of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And basically, those are the three ingredients that John has in mind as he's speaking about the God who is there. That you, you cannot remove these aspects from the God who is there and remain with the true God. Our God, to begin with, is good. And that is the reason why even in creating the universe as he has created it and given us the opportunity to be party to his creation, he has given us that which satisfies our senses that we can speak in terms of this is good. He himself in creating the world every so often would take a few steps backwards to admire his own works with these words. This is good. And that's the God who is there. And that's his work in even bringing us ultimately to heaven. It is always that he has put into us that aspect that will finally find all fulfillment in that place called heaven or the earth as a home of righteousness and it is us saying God is good. One way in which I often admire this is uh, with respect to birds. When it's nighttime, and then dawn comes around, the birds begin to sing. They, they know that this is our good God, and they begin to sing his praises. I've never forgotten many years ago, we had the eclipse of the sun, and it was in the mid-afternoon. So we sat outside, took the kind of glasses that they had given us so that the light doesn't affect our eyes. And we sat outside with the children and just outside our home. And as it was getting dark, mid-afternoon, the birds, the, the house sparrows, all started coming back and hide under the structures of our roof and so on. And within a few seconds, it began to get bright again. And they began to sing, joyfully for that matter. I'm sure they must have been looking at each other thinking, what has happened? You know? <laughs> but anyway, God is good. Let's sing his praises and so forth. It, it, it just meets creation at its point. God is good. The flowers blossom when they are under the light rather than under the darkness and so on. So it speaks about the joy that God himself gives to his creation and he himself rejoices in that it is his being. Well, with respect to righteousness, I don't need to say much about that because in the very beginning, God made it abundantly clear to humanity by giving us a conscience. And that immediately tells us that whoever has made us is a law-giving being. He is an ethical being. He gives law, and in order for us to relate to him, we must obey his law. He is by nature in that color. In heaven, he is worshipped as holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holiness is essential to his character. Remove holiness from him. You don't have the God 
the true God of heaven. He is by very nature holy. And that's the reason why he must punish sin. He is righteous. He is ethical in his very existence. But thirdly and lastly, it is the aspect of truth. The aspect of truth. We've already said that light can be understood in this way uh, through just a simple example of being in darkness and consequently being misled. But once the light is on, that is it. Well, that's what God has done. He has revealed himself. There is no way in which that which he has spoken we will discover later on to not have been true. Because it's his very nature, his self-revelation, we can rely upon it. The way of salvation that he has explained is the very truth. On the day of judgment, you can be able to speak to him and say that I have trusted solely on the finished work of our Lord Jesus Christ. I need no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that he has died and that he has died for me. And you can say, that's what your word says. And it settles the matter. Because our God is not only a God of truth, he is truth itself. There is no obscurity that he has left for us to do basic guesswork. This is the God who is there. So back to our text. John is saying, that's the nature of God. And there are no gray areas in him. He then quickly goes into the implications of this with respect to what he had talked about earlier. Remember earlier he had said in verse 3, that which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So we've proclaimed the gospel to you so that you may come into this communion with God that we are currently rejoicing about. That you might drink in that stream that makes glad the people of God. We've proclaimed that. Now he goes on to tell us that it is possible for you to claim that you are drinking of that stream when in actual fact you are not. Quickly read that. The six. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Remember, I spoke in terms of logic. If A is equal to B and B is equal to C, then C must be equal to A. And in this particular case, it's quite simple. Light and darkness can't mix. If you are darkness, and you are claiming to have communion with him who is light, something is not adding up. It cannot be true. That's the point that he is making here. There is an obvious contradiction, and immediately we should be able to pause and say, there's something that needs to be corrected here. When he speaks in terms of if we say we have fellowship with him, while we walk in darkness, I think it's important for us to recognize that something we're told earlier on about this walking, this walking. 
it is referring to an ongoing lifestyle. A lifestyle that is different from the nature of God. We said that God is good. Well, if your life is one that is spreading misery, God is righteous. If your life is being lived in wickedness and evil, however secret and private it might be, we've said that God is truth. If your life is one of hypocrisy, deceit, and so forth, then surely, if that's the life that is true of you, characterizes the way in which you live, then John is saying here that you are deceiving and you are deceived. You cannot have communion with God if this is true about you in an ongoing way. And I think, brethren, it's, it's only right that as we are being challenged to think about communion with God, as we are being made to see with spiritual eyes that table that is creaking under the weight of the deities of God's goodness as he has fellowship and communion with us, as we are seeing all this, we need to, first of all, take a moment and ask ourselves the question, is my claim to access to this table real? Is it genuine? Has it got integrity? Or is it one of a an individual who is misguided because I am but a hypocrite. It would be sad to be at a conference like this, to be challenged to think and muse over the, 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 the joy of communion with God and then go home without that communion with God at a very real and experiential level. And therefore, there are at least three areas from this that each one of us needs to ask ourselves and, and do some introspection lest we end up being hypocrites with misguided claims. The aspect of goodness should be quite straightforward because true Christianity, true religion is one that, to borrow the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, who got them from the book of Deuteronomy, it is, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second is like unto the first, you shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. In other words, it's characterized by love. By being an individual who wants to do good to others. Rather than one who is so self-centered, so selfish, that what you spread from your life is misery and gloom. Then we need to ask ourselves, is this true about me? Those who are around me, my wife, my children, do they thank God for me? Because of the love that radiates from my being? Because of God's work of grace in my soul? Not because I was born that way, 
but because through the process of sanctification, I've become more and more like Christ over time. And they are beneficiaries of this. Is that true? Or am I in the category where my wife can hardly sit and listen to my preaching because of her bitter experience in the home? And where still the children have become bitter towards Christianity, bitter towards the church, primarily because of me. My anger, my fury, my self-centeredness to the point where I injure them in every way and I don't care. The point is, you can't be like that and then say you are having communion with God. Because light and darkness cannot mix. Birds of a feather flock together. Well, what about righteousness? It speaks for itself. You cannot be a person who is entertaining sin. You love sin and wickedness. Your wardrobe is full of skeletons, dead men's bones. And simply because you have put some nice white paint on top of that grave that's full of dead, men, dead men's bones, you then think that even God is deceived. The brothers and sisters in the church might be deceived. The fellow elders might be deceived, but not God. God sees the heart. He sees what is in darkness. He sees what is behind pins on your phone or your iPad or tablet or uh, laptop or desk computer, whatever it is. That which you indulge in in secret, God sees it. And if it is sinful, he's disgusted by it. You cannot come from deliberately watching pornography and then go into prayer and say, I am having communion with God. You are not. You are not. You are going through a ritual, but it's a dead ritual. Because the God who is there is an ethical being. And therefore, he wants us to be a people who are pursuing righteousness, pursuing holiness, with genuine brokenness, going before him with our sins, that he might make us more and more like Christ. The third category, truth. And that makes its way right into the area of hypocrisy. Integrity and being individuals who are by personality not wanting to live a life, an ongoing life of being one thing to others when you very well know what is true about you is something else on the inside. Again, exactly the same thing. That if, if that's your life, that what your wife knows about you, what your children know about you behind those closed doors is completely different. It's, it's like light and darkness compared to 
who you are when you are now in church and with your fellow leaders. Again, you would not be having fellowship with God. You can't. Because the God who is there is a God of truth. He is a God of integrity. That's the God who is there. Now, brethren, this is bad enough when it's happening in the pew. It's bad enough. When you've got individuals who are claiming to be Christians and consequently claiming to be in a right relationship with God and having fellowship with God, and yet they, they seem to have a, a life that's just spraying misery wherever they are. And they are individuals who every so often when you come to know what's happening in their lives, it's, it's, it's a life of, of sin and wickedness. And we're still a life of hypocrisy. It's bad enough. It gives us as elders a lot of work in dealing with lives like that. It's worse when it's in the pulpit. A thousand times worse. And that's really where, at a conference like this, we desperately need to examine ourselves. We desperately need to. Because we cannot encourage other people to come to a meal that we ourselves are not eating. And it soon shows that we are aliens, we are strangers to what we learned earlier today about Enoch. Walk King with God. It soon shows. And the sad thing is that when that begins to show, it affects the congregation. It affects the church. It destroys the church. Because ultimately, you have somebody who is occupying the pulpit who ought not to occupy the Because he is starving where, in fact, he ought to be full to the brim with communion with the living God. So if there's anything that we need to do, it is to, in learning about fellowship with God, this koinonia with God, we, we need to examine ourselves. Yes, we need to examine the doctrine and the teaching concerning communion with God. But we also need to pause and say, is there something in my life, in an ongoing way, that's hindering this spiritual reality? The spiritual reality of genuine, real, growing, deep fellowship with the living God. To, to examine ourselves. Because, as John says here, life begins with the kind of God who is there. This is the message. We have heard from him and proclaimed to you that God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. As we are dealing with this subject of communion with God, let's remember the emphasis is not on communion. It is with God. With God. And don't let anybody ever recreate God in their own image. 
He has revealed himself in his word. It's not him who must change in order to entertain us. We must be the ones to change by the help of the Spirit of God in order for us to have access into his presence and to have a very real relationship with him. And therefore comes the question, do we have real, genuine, fellowship with him who is the light do we or are we as individuals making a claim that only a hypocrite makes now let me put it this way as i hurry on to close this is not about knocking us out of having any fellowship with God. This is God saying, if you want to have fellowship with me, you must come on my terms. And he's not asking us to try and rise to this in our own strength. We can't. We are born totally depraved. And even when we've come to him, as the Puritans would say, there is remaining sin in us. The root of sin. The power is broken, but the root is still there. What this is saying to us is that this same message, the gospel, that should have first brought us into relationship with him is the same gospel we desperately need now. In other words, when we find ourselves on the wrong foot with God, we make a beeline to the foot of the cross. That's where we go. And we say, Savior, Savior, while on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. May that blood that is sufficient for the worst of sinners, even today again, wash me clean. It is to be able to, to go back to the foot of the cross and, and plead that the spirit of the living God may again renew the image of Christ in me. In other words, that there might be integrity, that there might be truthfulness. God is not saying that we must be individuals who cannot remember the last time we ever sinned. No. But that we make a frequent trip to the foot of the cross and ask that he might make us more and more like Christ. But as we walk with him, as his word shows us the dark spots in our lives, we again go back to the foot of the cross and say, wash me clean, O Lord. Wash me clean. May this message send us there. To the cross. To the cross. Let's pray. Eternal and gracious God. Indeed you are the eternal light. How pure the soul must be when placed beneath thy searching light to not shrink, but instead smile and look on thee. Lord, how can we do so 
when we are surrounded by native darkness, when there's dimness even in our lives, O oh God of heaven, thank you for Calvary. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the blood that was shed there. Thank you for your spirit whose energizing power defeats sin even in the believer's life. That we might become more and more like Christ as we we're learning earlier today that by degrees we might grow in communion with you. Oh, Father, we plead, prevent us going down the path of hypocrisy, being a disgust to our wives and to our children while putting up a pious attitude in the context of the church. Oh, God, forgive us. Forgive us for any way that we have utterly put off those who know us better. Grant, Lord, that before them we might genuinely repent and that they might begin to see one who is truly walking with God in genuine brokenness, seeking to become more like Christ. Oh, Father, save us from a hypocrite's misguided claim. For Jesus' sake, amen.